Good afternoon. You're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour on WPPM 106.5 FM and watching on Philly Can TV. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. On today's show, we're going to talk with the creator, director of a new documentary that's based in North Philadelphia called Quest, Portrait of an American Family. I will be talking with the director, John Olszewski, and one of the stars and main characters of the film, Christopher Quest Rainey. We'll talk about the film and their experience filming over 10 years and more here on this edition of the People Power Lunch Hour. The People Power Lunch Hour is a weekly talk show produced by Philly Camp, where we talk with members of the community about local organizing, social movement, civic engagement, and more. Stay tuned and listen. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the People Power Lunch Hour Show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. On today's show, we are going to talk about a really excellent new documentary called Quest, Portrait of American Family, and it takes place here in North Philadelphia. I'm here joined in the studio by the director of the film, John Olszewski. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And also, uh, a great treat is to have Christopher Quest Rainey, one of the central figures of the movie, who's also here in the studio with us to talk about his experience in making the film with John. Welcome to the studio. Hello, how are you? So from your website, it says, filmed with verite, intimacy over a decade, Quest is the moving portrait of a family in North Philadelphia. Christopher, Christopher Quest Rainey, along with his wife, Christina, aka Ma Quest, opened the door to their home music studio, which serves as a creative sanctuary from the strife that grips their neighborhood. Over the years, the family evolves as everyday life brings a mix of joy and unexpected crisis. Set against the backdrop of a country now in turmoil, Quest is a tender depiction of an American family whose journey is a profound testament to love, healing, and hope. All those things and much, much more. John, I'll start with you. This began as kind of an extension of uh, a project from graduate school. You attended Temple University, and you wanted to make a short film about uh, a music studio that Quest has in his basement. Yeah, that's right. And so even, you know, kind of before Temple and grad school, I was uh, working construction and I was doing kind of still photo stuff on the side. And kind of through that and through doing different photo essays, um, I just started to kind of meet different people in North Philly, uh, which led to me teaching a photography class to adults in the neighborhood. And after class, you know, one day, this is like 2006, um, you know, one of my students was like, hey, you know, my brother runs a hip hop studio out of his house a couple blocks away. Do you want to meet him? So I was like, okay. So we walk on down, and uh, you know, uh, JC knocks on the door, and then Christopher Quest Rainey <laughs> opens it up and sees me kind of, uh, you know, standing there, and that was like sort of our first, you know, kind of interaction. At that that point, neither of us knew it was gonna we were gonna end up on this like, you know, multi-year, over a decade journey, uh, this like sort of collaboration in storytelling. Um, but sort of after that initial meeting, you know, uh, Quest invited me to come in and take some pictures of the guys at the studio just to promote them, uh, give them a boost. And uh, when I first got there, I just really fell in love with the place. Just like the energy, the passion, um, just, yeah, I was just blown away. And I was like, any way I can like, support, I'm happy to do this. And so I just kept coming and hanging out in the studio and just taking pictures. And, and then I heard that, you know, Quest doesn't just do, you know, the studio, but he had a day job, you know, working a paper route. Uh, which I kind of related to that working life versus the creative life, you know, dynamic and having to balance the two, doing construction and photo. And I asked, hey, do you mind if I go on the paper route with you um, and and do this sort of photo essay that kind of, you know, kind of, you know, parallels those two sides of, you know, uh, his personality and his, you know, his daily routine. 
And so that led to me sleeping over the house, sleeping in the studio. We'd get up at three in the morning and spend the day with him and the guys you know, on the paper route and then maybe go back into the studio. And we did this for about a year and a half. And during that time, I got to know the family. And I just realized there's so many layers um, to this like beautiful you know, group of people and had this idea like, hey, why don't we like make a short little documentary? And so that kind of coincided with me go- beginning the MFA program at Temple. And, you know, so we had a version of the film in December 2007 and was like, oh, it's, you know, not quite there. And I, you know, kind of worked on other things while I was at Temple, but kept pushing this. And, you know, 2008, there was a version. 2010, there was another version. But I just felt like, oh, it's not there yet. Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go go more. And then, you know, finally in 2017, we finally finished the film. That's a long story. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> so what did you think of John when he shows up in your home in North Philly? Honestly speaking, uh, my my first initial uh, reaction was, okay, what does this cop want? You know, because in our neighborhood, you know, it's predominantly black people. So when somebody of, of a different race knocks on your door, uh, you in two things, either they're a cop or they're selling um, Amway products, so, so to speak. You know, so um, it was kind of funny when he knocked. And uh, my brother, because I didn't see my brother, my brother kind of was standing off the stoop. And I just saw John with the camera, and I'm like, okay, like, suspect, what does this guy want? But when he, we invited him in and talked to him and everything, and, like, you know, I really want to say thank you to my brother because, like, without my brother actually helping us two to meet, none of this would be possible. Our story wouldn't be out. Uh, our family lives wouldn't, you know, be told to the world or whatever. And my wife and I, we, you know, we're really open people, and, they, like, the thing about our studio is that, we open it to the public for the, it's, it's mainly directed for the children, <clears throat> the children, the teens that uh, really don't have anything to do, kind of hanging on a corner, uh, single parents, you know, stuff like that. You know, they all have hardships and things, but we found that they all had one thing in common. Everybody loved music. So my wife and I decided to, you know, start the studio really just to not only help our own children, but to help the people in the neighborhood have something to do, the younger kids have something to do besides, you know, hanging on the corners, getting into trouble. So, um, you know, the film is about your family, yes. right? And mm-hmm. and but also about life in North Philly. Yeah, yeah. And what? Where exactly do you live? I wondered, you know, because I recognize some areas, but like, what's the intersection? Right there, I'm on 23rd and Norris, right there. You know, or uh, between Norris and Burks on 23rd Street. Uh, the famous rapper Meek Mills, he always raps about 23rd and Burks, the same corner. You know, we're all kind of from the same neighborhood. And, you know, I watched those guys grow up, too. When they were little, they would, you know, some of them would come to the studio every now and then, you know, including him, too. And uh, it's, it's really a beautiful neighborhood, you know. To, uh, we have gardening around in the neighborhood and community leaders that we really go without being acknowledged, you know. So I guess this film, you know, kind of opens the door, for, you know, for, for people to meet meet those great, fantastic other people. Did you grow up in that same neighborhood? Yeah, uh, I lived in North Philly pretty much all my life. Uh, you know, besides, you know, going through my teenage years, running the streets or whatever, you know, predominantly North Philadelphia right there in that area was my specific stomping grounds. Um, I started uh, elementary school pretty much in 75 and, you know, started meeting other kids and things like that. And, you know, you find out a lot about your friends as you grow up, you know, and a lot of people were in the music um, in that, around that time in that era. When I was little, hip hop had just started coming on the scene in the 80s. You know, it was kind of fun, you know. Now, prior to this film, have, have you ever seen any films or media about North Philly? If I did, it was, you know, a lot of violence involved, or, and when you look at uh, the news, the news always talk bad about North Philly. And you would hear so many, you know, wrong things or incorrect, you know, stories about North Philly. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we did hear a lot about North Philly, and nothing quite speaks about North Philly, kind of like, you know, this in particular project that we're doing now. And what about you, John? What, I mean, you're, you're from Pittsburgh, right? I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, but yeah, I've been in Philadelphia since uh, 2000, so 17 years. I consider Philadelphia home, and uh, it's my family now. But yeah, in terms of like media depictions of North Philly, like, like you know, Quest said, you know, you get the, the news, you know, that just, you know, something bad happens and the sensationalized kind of depictions of the, these, you know, uh, you know, after the aftermath of a shooting or some kind of crisis, you've got the sirens and the police tape shots. And it just really doesn't reflect the complexity and the layers of, you know, the neighborhood, um, you know, and even to go into to Temple, there's like this, you know, it, you definitely have some kids that go out with a camera and just find some wild, you know, someone who's maybe, you know, got some issues out on the street and film with someone for 
a couple hours and then turn that, you know, and so there's like, you know, even in terms of like the storytelling, the power of storytelling, you know, often, you know, when folks go into North Philly with a camera, they come out with stuff for other audiences that sort of just reinscribe the stereotypes that, you know, people already think. And those are, it's just untrue. And, you know, and I think that I wanted to kind of go into the community and stick with the community and, and make a film in North Philly for North Philly. And that was the goal early on. And, you know, things have kind of gotten bigger, you know, um, you know, since those early days. But I think that 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 heart and that that dedication to the neighborhood and um, offering the film to the neighborhood and work and bringing the film to the neighborhood is still something that, um, you know, we, you know, are uh, collectively, you know, committed to. I mean, we have that in common here at Philly Cam because so many people, you know, they're they're from all over the city, but they come in here saying the same thing, like. There's all these great stories in our community. They're not being told. We don't like the way the media portrays us. Mm. We're not just all drugs and shootings. Right. And so it was nice to see that community element and that like real people live here and that people are nice. Yeah, definitely. You know, we always get the short end of the stick. I, honestly speaking, I, I really didn't realize how bad North Philadelphia got a rep, a rep until I started actually traveling outside like the the visiting boroughs or go to New Jersey you know, and talk to, you know, other people that really don't live, you know, haven't heard about North Philly or haven't really visited North Philly, but they heard all these bad things about North Philly. So it was really, you know, kind of like heartbreaking to me to really hear how people were afraid of North Philadelphia. And, you know, even now, like after we've been showing the film around, you know, here in Philadelphia, I've recently had, I spoke with some people that came to the film screening and they told me that they would never been to North Philly and they, they always heard bad things about North Philly. But seeing the film, they say, oh, I had such a bad impression about North Philadelphia. Now I can't wait to get there. You know, so it was really remarkable how people, you know, kind of like, how do you say, flip the script after watching the film, you know, then they get a better idea of what's going on. Well, that's the power of media, right? Mm -hmm. yes. To shape people's perceptions and... And unfortunately, a lot of the mainstream media does characterize it in this way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I liked about the film is like the aftermath of a, sh of a shooting, mm -hmm. right? So in the film, your daughter, uh, you know, is in the crossfire of a shooting near the playground. She's walking home and she is shot in the eye. And part of the film uh, deals with the aftermath of that. Uh, one, uh, how did you get on the scene so fast? But John, and and my question to you is, you know, why did you decide to allow him to to film in in the hospital and and it, and you know just that whole time after you know she was PJ was shot. So yeah, so this was um, 2013. So at this point, we were like you know, six, seven years into this, you know, project, but also into our, our friendships. We'd built a lot of trust at that point. And I was actually in South Dakota in an airport, ready to come back home after being away for about nine days on another film shoot. And I got a call from my wife saying that PJ got shot. And I was just like, it just couldn't even wrap my mind around it. It was just like devastated. And I, and, and I just cried the whole plane ride home. And when I got back to, to Philly, you know, Quest got in touch with me and I saw messages from him about it. And at this, at this time in terms of the film too, we'd already, you know, been working on it for many years. So I was actually editing. I thought we were, we had finished filming in December, 2012. And so I was editing the film and, you know, we got in touch. I was like, well, what can I do to support you guys? Anything you need. And, you know, Quest, you know, kind of had a really, um, you know, um, Prolific, really, prolific idea, so to speak. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it was more or less, I, I said, John, listen, would you mind coming, bringing your camera to the hospital and filming PJ? Like, you know, because my wife and I talked about, uh, like, uh, healing already. Like, we were already on healing once we realized, okay, this is the things that she's going to need. Like, that night it didn't happen, you know, headaches all night long, brainstorming, trying to figure out what happened, trying to, you know, come to reality and grips of our own neighborhood and how could this happen to our daughter. So, you know, we really just, you know, we really just kind of, like, sat there and just kind of stared at each other and just – trying to figure a way to, you know, help her heal as soon as possible and quickly as possible and not let her become the poster child, you know, for a gun advocacy because what happens, which we always notice, and it, and it actually happened in PJ's case also, where all the cameras came out and all the promises came out to help her be a better person and get back on her feet as soon as possible and, you know, offer her all these dreams and, you know, trips around the world to make her feel better, you know, feel good type stories. But none of these things actually happen. You know, uh, from all these quote unquote people or, you know, community uh, leaders and things like that. So my wife and I kind of already knew that was going to be the case, you know, by by being 
in front of a camera beforehand, we kind of knew how how the media starts to work and how they you know they you know they function. So we took it upon ourselves to call John and say, "Hey, John, would you mind doing this for us?" And you know. John even, like, you know, you could hear it in his voice, like, what? Are you for real? But it was more or less, yes, we needed this, and it really helped, and it really benefited us because uh, what it did, it was a healing process for PJ. She could see what happened to her and how she she got back on her feet, how she rose, you know, back to the where she was at and maybe even stronger, you know. So that was the whole idea, and then it actually worked. You know, it worked for our benefit. She um we talk about it. She gets to communicate because, you know, not to take anything away from anybody that does therapy or anything like that, because I'm not a therapist, so I don't know professionally. But I know at the end of the day, when you go home, you can't talk to the therapist anymore at three in the morning. You can't unless you're paying for it, so to speak, or, you know, whatever you have it set up for. But in our case, PJ can always talk about the film. She can talk to somebody every day. She can communicate and, you know, get the get get how she really feels out and you know like she says and i always say this because you know she repeats this whenever we talk about it she learns to have empathy for other people and so do we you know because at one time like she said you know she never thought about somebody's disability as really being serious or you know trying to understand it she you know she kind of looked at it as jokingly but when she had to go through that situation she started understanding what it is to have empathy for some people and you know we need to learn that and have that in our communities a lot more and just to have pj get back on her feet and you know be as strong as she was that was what we really you know wanted to happen and you know through john's assistance it really happened and actually the world everyone who saw the film you know so when they talk to pj you know they pat her on her back and they tell her go you can do anything you want so yeah definitely if you're just tuning in or watching us uh you're listening to the people power lunch hour show on philly cam i'm vanessa maria graber and i'm joined in the studio by John Olszewski and Christopher Quest Rainey. And they're here to talk about their film, Quest, A Portrait of an American Family, which is all about Christopher's family in North Philadelphia. So there are many precious moments in the, in the film. And um, this kind of speaks to uh, the really great job in the production and the editing. But reality, there's probably a lot that was not shown because you filmed for so much. Uh, how did you begin to start uh, cutting down the footage and, and sifting through it? Of course, these are people's, this is their life, right? And so how did you begin to make those decisions of what to show in this film? I think that, you know, we ended up with almost 400 hours of footage. So it was an overwhelming amount of material and just so many layers and, and so many beautiful scenes. And so we had to, you know, for me, I think the goal of the film and, and bringing a team onto the film in the later years of the project, you know, um, we had this sort of shared, you know, kind of a shared vision for what we wanted the film to do. And I, we wanted to tell a story from the point of view of the Rainey family, you know, to show North Philly from the perspective of someone who actually lives there as opposed to this, like, you know, outside looking in sort of thing. And we wanted to, to craft a film that would build connections between our viewers and the Rainey family. So that's what we measured every kind of moment, you know, up against. It's like, is this going to allow the viewer to connect and, and understand them in a, a deeper way than, um, you know, than um, maybe they would, would, would sort of think or assume. And so really focusing on universal moments. Um, and also, too, there was, there, you know, there were definitely some moments that while I was filming, I just knew that it's just a powerful moment and, you know, that it would probably make the film. And there were other moments that we discovered, you know, just in the edit by looking through raw footage and, and knowing sort of how the different stories and different threads sort of, you know, ended up. It's like, oh, okay, now we need, need a piece of this to set up this thing that happens later. And, um, and so, you know, work with our editor Lindsay Utes um, you know she worked on the film full-time for a year just going through the material and then we would look at you know look at scenes and look at you know cuts and then discuss them and measure them up again against this idea of like is this gonna allow a viewer to connect to this family and so that's how you know we made our decisions and um, and yeah and we're just really proud of sort of where we where we landed this collaboration that really started with the neighborhood and you know um the rainy family um but also kind of being able to bring in some you know talented filmmakers who finished you know feature films before too because this is my first feature film to kind of help show me the way you know to how what is the process how do you like you know make you know kind of a sense out of 400 hours of footage and so with Lindsay and then also our producer sabrina schmidt gordon uh, we just had a lot of discussions and also because there were versions of the 
film, you know, we'd screen them with the Rainey family. And so we were able to talk about those early versions, you know, the, the 2008 version, the 2010 version, the 2013 version. And so we talked about that stuff, you know, as the years, you know, went by. And that allowed us, me to really have a sense of like their vision and what they wanted to say and what they were connecting to and, and, and things that maybe we should change moving forward. And so that was a, an ongoing dialogue over, you know, this, this 10 year period. How did you explain John to people? Was he following you around all the time? Or did people think it was strange? Like, oh, there's that white guy filming the Rainies again. <laughs> no, at first, I must admit, though, when, uh, like, when John first started following, following me around with the camera, a lot of people would look and, you know, they'd be like, you know, what y'all, sh y'all shooting a music video? <laughs> you know, that's the first thing everybody thinks, you know, you shoot a music video? That's, you know, after a while, we just start saying, yeah, you know, but really, you know, we would just, John would just get up with me and just ride out early in the morning like and throwing those papers we'd be off the truck on the truck off the truck on the truck and we walk 10 miles a day and john's walking backwards with the camera like it's amazing just watching him try to film us and people riding down the street literally will just stop or you know some uh, camera hams that you know try to get in the background and do some crazy stuff but no it was actually a pretty fun you know situation you know as it was going on you know, and then being able to explain it to some people, you know, what actually what was going on was really interesting, too, because, oh, wow, I can't wait to see it. You know, and I wonder if, you know, if any of those people that actually saw us filming over the years, you know, got a chance to see it. I'm pretty sure they would be pretty happy. They're yeah. probably also like, that was a long time ago. Really, really, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Honestly, you know, because, like, the first year, like, we thought, like, you know, like we said, we thought it was a small project. And then because of our friendship growing, it was kind of easy to forget the cameras there, you know, because John's there, you know, but, you know, he's so long, you know, we'll feed him and, you know, we'll eat and we'll hang out and we'll do all these things together. And after a while, you forget that, you know, he's doing, a, you know, a job, you know, or he's trying to complete a project. So it really, you know, the camera kind of, how can I say it? it's just like the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it, but you know, it's there, so to speak, you know, it fades into the background. Right, exactly. And it was fun, you know, to be honest with you, you know. Like trying to like certain situations, like as the kids, you know, teenagers do silly things or whatever, and they'll peep around the room to see if John is in the room sometimes, you know, as they, you know, watching them get older and things like that. So that's really funny. At first, you know, the kids, they love it. But when they want their privacy, as they get older, they kind of like, oh, my God, oh, John's over here today. I'm not going to hang in the house today. You know, so those times, those moments were kind of, you know, fun. And how did you kind of explain this to your family? Because at first it was, you, you came into the studio mm -hmm. to shoot the fata out to the to other rappers and MCs. Right. And then he wanted to do the film about, about you throwing the papers. Mm -hmm. But then the camera turned towards yeah, the family and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, you know, you know, I, I guess that was kind of a, like a, it's hard to explain that those moments because they kind of like went kind of quietly, you know, as we were filming and I'm like, hey, babe, John's going to shoot, you know, you cooking in the kitchen today or, you know, hey, kids, John's going to shoot you guys playing outside today. It Pretty much they, everybody was like, OK, you know, we kind of nonchalant because, like I said, the friendship we had, you know, kind of solidified the fact that he was always there. And, you know, unless it was something really specific, private, where the kids were like, can you not shoot that? You know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a problem. You know, we, we do have, you know, privacy, you know, control over our lives, you know, so to speak. So it wasn't an issue of, like, John just whipping out the camera at a very sensitive moment where we didn't want him to film. Uh, of course, you know, it was a certain part of the film. I don't want to give it away, but my wife and I had a very serious discussion about, you know, talking about my daughter, you know, and, uh, like, People thought, like, okay, well, who was she talking to in the film? Was she talking to you? No, she wasn't talking to me. She was actually talking to John. But not in the sense of him being a cameraman, but just him a sense of being in the room. You know, like I said, you know, we really don't have – it wasn't anything we had to hide. It was an open discussion we were having anyway. And it was it just kept to work, you know, so to speak, for the film, which I thought was really great because, like, I don't know. I want to say it, but I want people to see the film, so I'm not going to talk more about it. I'm I know. There's so many tightening. parts I really want to talk about, but then I'm like, yeah. oh, it's telling too much. Right. <laughs> and how did you kind of achieve this, like, almost, like, invisibility is how I describe it, because it doesn't feel like a... It doesn't feel like someone's holding a camera. It just kind of feels not really like, intrusive, so to speak. Right. right it yeah. feels like this kind of like omniscient, like all present, mm -hmm. like you know, film. Kind of. Yeah, I was just you know tagging along, you know, and so I was there. I spent you know a lot of time. So it was like long days, and 
you know, it's just like, yeah, people are just used to being around and they have to live their lives. And there were some, sometimes where I would even sleep over the house for multiple days in a row. And so I was just sort of this constant presence. And, and it wasn't like I was just, you know, not interacting or anything. Sometimes we'd be hanging out, but then all of a sudden, you know, someone would come in and a conversation would start and I would sort of be like, oh, well, hold on. I would start filming and, you know, people were just used to me, you know, kind of being there. And, and, um, and again, we've been doing it for so many years that it just was like, yeah, at some point you just have to live your life and have conversations you have to live, have to have. And, you know, I just happen, you know, to, to be around and, 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 and it's like, I think that like, there's this sort of, I would say like filmmaker subject, you know, symbiosis that happens. It's like, you're aware of each other's, you know, presence. Um, and, and one thing that I, you know, talk about that's, that's kind of funny is like, you know, Quest talked about me walking backwards and stuff on the paper route. And, you know, for me, I had like this sixth sense that like, oh, like, you know, or I thought I had a sixth sense that, I, oh, I can just walk backwards. I just feel if there's like an obstacle or a telephone pole or a step or something or a crack in the way, and I'm just able to avoid it. And then years later, I was telling Quest about, hey, man, I got this like really great sixth sense where I can just watch, walk backwards and, you know, not bump into anything. He's like, no, you realize that when we're, we're walking down the street and you're filming that I'm like navigating left to right on the sidewalk so you don't kill yourself. Right. You know, <laughs> so it's like if you ever want to get rid of me for any, you know, at any point, he easily could have walked me right into a garbage truck and I would have been, <laughs> been done for, done filming. And so, but yeah, it's like it, it was a collaboration, you know, throughout. And I think that just the time spent in the relationship is sort of what leads to that, that intimacy and that sense that there wasn't necessarily a camera in the room because it was just, you know, they treated me like a family member. And, and that's sort of, I think, um, what viewers receive from seeing the film, not sort of this like intrusive, you know, presence, but sort of this warmth of like, you know, and, and yeah, I, I think there was just a, a feeling of warmth that we had, you know, back and forth, you know, through the fun times and the laughter, there's a lot of times laughing behind the camera and having a great time. And, and there's definitely times where I'm crying behind the camera and, mm. you know, and some of those really hard moments yeah you know <clears throat> john definitely is a very sensitive person you know I, you know i'm not gonna throw you under the bus but we did have you know i've watched that man you know literally go through emotional changes along with me like doing like doing a loss of my mother doing a loss of my brother a lot of things happen you know that's not in the film you know but we the film is not to make everybody feel sad or you know miserable about you know life itself but to bring joy into their lives so a lot of stuff didn't make the cut that you know you know i wish it would have just so it could really tell the, the whole story about the struggle you know and like and watching you know how hard it is to keep a smile on your face you know during the course of hard times but but also it shows the unity too you know it really shows like like us getting stronger the more we were losing the stronger we were becoming at the same time so that really helped out a lot you know and did for us to look back at the film and say hey you know you know how far we came back you know i remember when the whole house needed a roof you know not just that room you know i mean we you know when we had to fix this and fix that and we didn't have a budget for this and a budget for that you know and then at the same time the kids had to go to school and you know it was just really nice to look back now for ourselves to look back at the film you know and the people say you know great job and we look at them and say boy if only you knew you know so you know i'm really you know i'm happy for the film to be out too but you were just being yourselves you yeah know? i mean it is a great job but yeah. it's like that we're just that was the easy part you right? know just so being us. yeah so if anybody comes up and asks us a story you know we don't have to lie or try to think about you know a script that we came up with because nothing was scripted even when you know the paper you know i throw the papers or whatever you know i've been doing that so long i don't know if you've seen that part but you know that's kind of natural to me too you, know. you have a good shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, that's where PJ gets it from because PJ's a ball player, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get that that question like every Q&A. Like, yeah. was that real? How many takes did it take to do that? I'm going right. to just start telling but It was all CGI. <laughs> it was all CGI. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm glad to hear all of this. But, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm honest, it's like when I first read about the film, I said, like, this can kind of be exploitative, you know. Yeah. There's like a white guy student coming into North Philly who's going to tell the story of a black family, right. like living the struggle, but it didn't turn out that way. Right. Exactly. And so I'm kind of glad it didn't either. <laughs> why do you think that is? And, and were you conscious of, of, of that, you know, as you took your camera into their homes and were filming them? Yeah, no, absolutely. That was a question from the very beginning. And, and I had great people along the way questioning me, like, what are you doing? What are your intentions? Like, what are you going to do with this film? And, um, you know, whose who's voice are you reflecting? Is this about you sort of imposing, you know, sort of your viewpoint? Or is it about you, you know, listening? And so I think having mentors and um, other filmmakers, other artists, other people, just there's just 
so much discussion, but also, you know, ultimately I think it was the relationship with the family. Mm. It was like, I'm not going to take this thing and run with it. This is something that I, I perceive us doing together. And I think as the, the, the film, you know, developed and got deeper, it was something that we, you know, sort of collaboratively decided we want to go deeper. I think the Rainies wanted to tell their story. Um, and I think my job as a director in a lot of ways was to get out of the way um, and sort of let them kind of connect to viewers directly. And I don't, I mean, and, and that was my job, to connect them and, and not really impose anything. And I think spending so much time, I was able to understand what, what, is, their, what is their message, you know, what, and, and, and also, too, just, you know, how they're experiencing things. So I, I, I witnessed that, and I experienced that with them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, the relationship was a, a big part of it. And then, you know, and it was always, gonna, in the early days, it was going to be this small thing. You know, maybe we have done a couple of festivals, but I always imagine, hey, we're going to jump in a van with a projector and, you know, go to different cities and do, like, this little DIY tour. And, you know, then, you know, eight years into it, we realized, okay, we've got funding and it's going to be on public television. Now, all of a sudden, the stakes are so much higher. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that, that weight of responsibility to get the story right and to really honor the Rainey family um, and be truthful, you know, to kind of be true to, to this their experience uh, was, was so important. And I think that, you know, discussions, you know, with uh, the film team about how to sort of structure that on like a frame by frame, scene by scene, you know, basis. But I think embedded in the raw material is that, that warmth and that friendship. And I think that's um, hopefully that, you know, kind of what makes it feel like not some just white guy telling guys thing. And, you know, some folks would say that that's just a, a rule you don't break, like let, you know, folks from a community tell their own story and don't, you know, interfere. Um, I think that, it is possible to do it right. Um, you know, that's why I made the film. And I mm -hmm. stick with it. Um, but I, I, but I totally, you know, um, understand uh, why people are, you know, um, anxious about that because it's done, been done wrong so many times, um, and it's left, you know, kind of communities. Um, and more you know, damage, do you? Yeah, yeah, it's, it can be damaging. And just yeah, representation is a huge thing. And, and you know, it, I think building bridges is 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 critical, and, and every detail kind of plays into that. And I think that. Um, you know, you need to listen, um, listen for a long time if you're going to come from the outside into a community and then work with the community when you're bringing a film out, you know, don't bring it out everywhere else, bring it to them. Mm -hmm. All right. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour show and I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber. I've been speaking with John Olszewski and Christopher Quest Rainey, and they're here to talk about their new film, Quest, at which is out in theaters now it's going to be showing in philly this week uh we're going to take a short break we're going to talk more with them about the film and all of the festivals and tours that they've been mm. on um and much much more so don't go anywhere keep it locked here on wppm 106.5 fm and on philly cam tv on comcast and verizon we'll be right back Welcome back. You're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour show. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber, and we're here at Philly Cam today to talk about a really great new documentary film, which takes place in North Philadelphia 
and it's called Quest, a a portrait of an American family. And I'm here with the director of the film, uh, John Olszewski, and also Christopher Quest Rainey, who is the subject of the film, along with his family. And so earlier we were talking about representation and including the voices of the subjects. It's something I wish more journalists in Philly would do, especially mainstream media. Uh, Those things are so key in in getting the stories right. So I wanted to ask you how you felt, you know, from the beginning towards the end of the film. um, And and if you developed more of a voice in, in wanting to have a say in how your family was represented. Uh, as far as the film goes, no, well, no, actually, uh, everything kind of went fine as far as being represented as when we were watching everything unfold or being put together, the, the whole process. The, everything was explained to us. It wasn't like, okay, I'm going to spring this on them and see what they say, and then, you know, hopefully they'll like it or whatever. Because, like, like I said, John and I are friends, so we get a chance to talk about everything. And <clears throat> also, you know, not just talking to John, I had outside mentors that I talked to in my neighborhood, community people, that, you know, we talk about what was going on in my life. You know, hey, I got this guy filming, he's a friend of mine, you know, whatever. And then we bring up the subject, okay. And then I always, you know, they always ask me, well, is he white? You know, and, and you know, I'm like, yeah. And they're like, okay, well, is he telling your story? Is he telling his story? And, I, you know, I kind of look at him because I didn't understand at first what they meant by that. But, you know, when I started looking at the footage and rewind, okay, now, would I have put that in my life out in the public? Or what? Okay, now it's starting to come to me now. You know, and uh, really it was, the whole thing was like, if, if I could have created the story blind myself, specifically for myself, that's what it would have been. You know, I'm not an editor, so I couldn't figure out how to put it together like I wanted to. Because, you know, believe me, John had plenty of footage to, to play with, you know. Uh, I forgot how many hours of footage. Like 400. 400 hours of footage to play with, you know, that we got down to an hour and 45 minutes. So, you know, we, we, we didn't get a lot in there, you know. I would have loved for people to meet my uh, my stepfather, you know, Donald Reagan or Leroy Smith as his real name, uh, you know, and uh, or my mother, you know, specifically. But we didn't get a chance to film her before she passed away. Uh, there's so much that could have happened or, you know, um, that I could have, you know, that I wanted to get out there, but we couldn't. But what we what was there, what put, was put together was satisfying. It told a beautiful story. I mean, it's like. John's a poet with his eyes, you know, so to speak. You know, I got to give him credit for that, you know. And through that, you know, I've, I've learned a lot. And, you know, uh, my good friend David Barnes, he's in social media. Uh, he's a radio host on, on another station. And um, he was telling me, like, things that he knew, like, when it comes to filming. And, you know, he's not filming, but he has a lot to do with audio. And, you know, there were little certain tricks and things like we would use in the studio and things. And I would bring that to the table when John and I would go out shooting, like, I'll... Uh, He'll let me like do the boom operating for that day or whatever. Well, assist, not let me, but you know, you know, help, you know, ask me to help and I'll help. But um, learning how to do certain things was really, you know, the fun part, the experience. Uh, I didn't know it was so much camera gear you could wear. You know, I felt like RoboCop one day. I had all this gear on me trying to walk down the street and throw the papers at the same time. That was fun. You know, and then we were watching my children see what was going on, like seeing them being filmed and, you know, those moments where they want to talk to me and the camera's rolling. They're like, Dad, can you tell John? I talked to you in the other room, and we, you know, okay, we'll go in the other room. I'm like, that's all you wanted to say? You could have said that, you know. And they were like, well, I don't know. I'm not sure what to say, Dad. I said, just be yourself, you know, things like that. So, yeah, our story really was being told, you know, you know, from, you know so, so to speak. It's just that enough of it, you know, we couldn't get out there as, as much as we would like to. So maybe, you know, hopefully, you know, we might have a part two or part three, maybe even a mini series. That would be awesome. <laughs> you know? Well, you certainly have enough footage for that. Yes, yeah, definitely. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... You have been accepted to a number of film festivals, including Sundance. You won Full Frame, which is mm-hmm. a really, I used to live in, in Chapel Hill, Durham area, so it's, that's a big deal. Yeah. Also, uh, congratulations. Um, how, how, has, how has going and bringing it to the public uh, made you feel, and, and, and what kind of reaction are you getting? Oh, wow. I must say, uh, from, from the subject point of view, when we go into these towns, like our, these towns that don't have a lot of black people in them, and we go to uh, show the f- film there, when we first get there, it's kind of like we kind of see like the, the distance and the separation, you know. And then once people see the film, and they, you know, they might see us doing a Q and A there, and then it's like their whole mi- you know, mindset has changed. Hey, we need to talk. You know, you should be a politician. You know, hey, has your wife ever thought of going into, you know, in, in the policies, making policies for your neighborhood, things like that? You know, all kinds of things that come up after the film. So it's been like a you know up and down roller coaster. But for for, for what it's worth though, uh, the film festival circuit is 
like the best thing to do if you can do that that's what i would do if i could that would be my vacation for a year just to go film festival hopping you know and i definitely want to give a shout out to true false film festival too because they they those guys it's like going to sesame street down there you know and um you know, and Full Frame was awesome, too, because their food was the best. Like, when they served, like, they had the food and hors d'oeuvres and the party. We had. It wasn't really a party, but, like, a gathering, and that was so awesome. You know, so, yeah, like, all the film festivals and got getting to talk to people. And when you get to the uh, city and people see these things. And actually, this film does spark so much controversy and so much, you know, conversation that politicians have actually walked up to us and said, hey, I'm a politician. Well, so what do you think we can do to change or what would you do? And I really have no idea, you know, about their situation because, I, you know, I really don't live where you live at. But if, it, if you could bring your politics and your ways to help us up here, this is what we need in North Philadelphia, you know. So, you know, it's really hard, at, you know, to talk to certain people about certain things. But it's, in another way, it's really easy, you know, to communicate with everybody, and, you know, and the love. Like the love is like I didn't know America had love, you know, in it, you know. These last couple of years have been very frightening, you know, so to speak, you know, especially this last year. And, uh, like, because it seems like no one has empathy anymore. You're like, either you're Democrat or Republican, you're working class or you're non-working class. Everybody's, like, gotten so separate right now. And, you know, it's, America is a really scary place to be. But this film kind of helps you to forget all that for, like, five minutes. It helps you to, you know, say, you know, well, we do have things in common. You know, we do live the same way. And, you know, this is more than politics that we're facing here, you know. So I really hope a lot of people get to see the film. A lot of people, you know, a lot of how can I say a lot of people, white collar people, you know, so to speak. That's what I want to see. And John, how yeah. did you feel? I mean, uh, this is your first feature first film. First feature. Well, it just, you know, it, it was funny. So at our, at our premiere at Sundance, you know, it's been like 10 years. And for me, obviously, you don't film with a family for 10 years if you don't enjoy the process and so i enjoyed being with these guys and doing it and so i did feel a little bit melancholy like oh this is like the end of the road this is the end of the journey and and so that first screening i was like oh, an hour and 45 minutes 10 years and now it's, it's already over um but then like 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 quest was saying like going and being able to travel with them it's like the the journey just continues it's like you know that the daily routine's a little bit different but it's like i you know i sort of i make for films to make friends and now like that the film is out there and, and I think we did our job that people are connecting to the Rainey family through the film when we're there in person like people are coming up and and the vulnerability and the the honesty that the Rainey's kind of um, you know have in the film people bring that to them and, 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 and bring that to us and share their own personal stories and like you know in this moment I really saw myself or I went through something very similar and I just want to give you a hug I just like really connected to that and and I think that you know the film is an invitation to connect and you know and I think you know we made the film for you know, kind of, you know, a neighbor in North Philly to, to see yourself, but also it could be, you know, some rich guy on Wall Street or a rural farmer or whoever, like, you know, because we focused on those universal human moments, anybody can see this and connect. And then you have to acknowledge, like, I am connected to this family, this specific family in North Philly, like we're together. And then I would hope that, you know, the challenge is thrown out there, like now, like, let's actually you know, live our lives, you know, and acknowledge that and make choices, you know, based on this, this, this sense of connection, you know, like if we're connected, then why is a neighborhood like this have to sort of endure these types of obstacles? Um, what is my responsibility to kind of get involved and, you know, support? Um, and so I think that's like been really incredible, you know, and, um, yeah, you know, we've met so many really cool people, you know, throughout and just even being able to see other filmmakers and, and their subjects. It's like this. Yeah, it's this funny thing. It's like you're almost like bands on tour. You know, you kind of start to see people, you know, over and over again. And now we're at the end of the year. And so some of us were converging again with like award nominations and things like that. And, you know, but at the end of the day, it's a really about bringing the film to the people where they're at. And so we're enjoying, you know, the festival stuff and, and the theatrical, you know, kind of release that we're doing. Um, but ultimately, most excited about the community engagement and impact campaign we're building around the film to partner with organizations that are already kind of on the ground doing good work in places like North Philly, addressing sort of the issues that you see, you know, in the film, whether it's like, you know, economic inequality, gun violence, addiction, um, you know, kind of art as, um, you know, healing, you know, there's organizations that are doing great work and sort of wanting to offer the film up to them to support their work. And I think it's a great catalyst for for dialogue, but then hopefully it goes beyond dialogue and, and, and true connection and action comes out of it. Yeah, when I saw the film, my first thought was, I feel like I know these people, <laughs> you know, because there's such a familiarity about your story 
and you know just the warmth that your family has and the second thing i thought was like that's so philly Mm -hmm. you know the way people talk it you know make it hip-hop in the basement you know john (laughs) yeah you know and um just the neighborhood you know and and the people in the neighborhood and uh you know if you are from philly and you and you know people from north philly and you've been inside their homes and spent time there then you see the film and it's like familiar right and i think that's like the beauty of it because um you know i worked in camden and i worked with you know with poor people and i didn't really know until i went into people's homes Mm -hmm. you know and spent time with them and see how they lived and had food with them Mm -hmm. and you know coffee and 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 understood so i felt it was like kind of that same way you're like inviting people to come inside and like see how you live yeah. and that it's like it's not scary that you're just regular people dealing with a lot of the same issues as everybody else mm-hmm. so in terms of like connecting there's so many opportunities for people to connect yeah definitely like um like even like when john first came like john's nickname in our neighborhood is peter parker and he got that name from one of the guys from the studio like from john coming in and taking pictures and like we connected real fast and he connected with the guys real fast. I think we, we connected John the most like immediately. Uh, one day he came in and was snapping pictures and John climbed up on my furniture and like he's literally standing on a table taking pictures. And as the guys coming into the studio session, they're kind of like looking like, is this, is this, why I quest this guy standing on your table and you're not saying anything. Like we can't even sit on, like sit a cup down without a coaster without you getting mad, you know? So it kind of like, and then Price kind of like talked to him like, you know, I'm gonna call you Peter Parker because you know, you always climb on things like Spider-Man and this, that, and the third. So, you know, the connection there was like so instantaneous, but it was so simple. And like, that's kind of how our neighborhood is. Like we connect to people real fast. Like it's like, like, the, like once we have that open dialogue di- directly, you know, we can, you, you know, automatically, you know, you can, f- find some kind of connection and friendship here in Philadelphia, not just North Philadelphia. I'm talking about the whole Philadelphia. You know, that's the type of people we are here in Philadelphia. You know, we're friendly people. We're open. If you know, people just have to talk to people like this world has grown so cold and so scared with, you know, with the politics these last couple of years, like nobody, you know, everybody's kind of shut down, but I'm here to say people, please keep your dialogue open. Start talking to your friends, start talking to your neighbors. Even if you don't like your mom and your dad for the decisions that they make, still respect them and talk to them. You never know, you know, what you're missing. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Like, you know, the, the film has been called a labor of love so many times and probably like a reference to like how long it, it took to make it. And the fact there was no budget or anything for many years. But from my experience, like it was a labor of love, but I was on the receiving end of it because this family and this community really embraced me and took care of me and fed me and and all of this you know for all these years and i just want viewers to to recognize that and 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 feel that um because i think that you know wider society that might be scared of north philly it's like you're they're missing out because there's so much beauty um there's so much warmth there and just it's just an invitation to connect um and then also yeah get together like it is true that some scary things do happen in the neighborhood but that's because of you know the system failing and we need to get the system right so that we can support these beautiful families that are out there yeah, even in the film when the shooting happens, you know, it like doesn't descend into chaos. Right. For the most part, you guys keep it together. You try to stay positive for your daughter. Mm-hmm. It seems like you're like we need to yeah. be strong and you ultimately get through it. And mm-hmm. and also um uh with your son, uh what's his name again? He has William. A, William mm-hmm. has cancer. Yes, and, definitely. Uh, mm-hmm. And so there's also this, you know, um, this tension, like, oh my gosh, is he going to get through this? What's going to happen? Mm-hmm. But you know, like, you're you survive, you get through it, yeah, and you do it with love, right? Right, because William, when William first got sick, like William was the first tragedy, like out of our children, like that was really massive, besides a little boo-boo or scratches or whatever. Because when we found, you know, found out William had the cancer, you know, it was like mind-boggling to us. He was doing his little odd job. Actually, he had a side job at uh, Wawa, and he was working. Uh, behind the counter and he actually lost his vision instantly and it was gone for like a half hour and when he came back he just came home we took him to the hospital to get him checked out or whatever and they found that he had a tumor on his brain and like that that really everybody kind of like froze you know now that part of our lives was really the test before even before pj because william had that happened actually a year uh, almost a, a year to date before pj got shot so to deal with that was really 
you know, hard then. Then William had, had, at the same time, William was having his first child, you know. So now, okay, he's young, first child. Now we're raising his son because we don't know if he's going to survive because, you know, brain cancer is, you know, is really difficult to fight. And he pulled, he pulled through, you know, and he, he beat the cancer and everything. He's cancer-free. And Isaiah's doing good. Actually, this is Isaiah's fifth birthday year, you know, so we're celebrating that. And, you know, that really taught us first, okay, let's, Let's understand that something's happening to our child and how do we deal with it. That, you know, a lot of footage that didn't get, that didn't make the cut, but our emotions were running wild that whole year. And then for that to happen to PJ behind that, you know, the next year was like, okay, now we're already numb. So let's just, how are we going to keep this moving? You know, how are we going to, you know, survive this? And, you know, the camera was there to capture all of that, you know, and, you know, and it, it, it helped us even like looking back at William, William looks back at the footage itself now and, you know, he sees how slim he had gotten, how much weight he lost. And now he's, you know, he's heavy again and, you know, he's feeling jolly, you know, so we're, we're, we're grateful for that, you know, that he's here for his son. And sometimes like when I'm home now, I'm grandpa, you know, pop pop and Isaiah is always with me sometimes when William's hanging out with his homies or friends or whatever. So I do get a little jealous when William comes home and uh, and and Isaiah get up and run down the street, Dad. You know, because I, you know, I was there with Isaiah his first year during William's, you know, struggle, and uh, that that really, you know, I, I really that really attached me a little bit more to Isaiah even harder, you know, because I didn't I, we didn't know the outcome, so in my mind, okay, you know, I have to be more than just pop pop for that time, you know, you know, and that's what I was for that time, and. My wife was, you know, more than, you know, more than grandma, you know, so like during that, that first year, you know, of the, our first struggle with our children, our first major struggle with our children was not easy. But we, you know, we persevered and, you know, we want people to understand it's not easy, but that's what the film is about, making it through. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to the People Power Lunch Hour show here on Philly Cam TV and on WPPM 106.5 FM. I'm your host, Vanessa Maria Graber, and we've been talking to uh, two people who created a really wonderful film called Quest, a portrait of an American family, and it takes place here in North Philly, and it is about the family of Christopher Quest Rainey. And it is a film made by John Olszewski. And so we're talking about the film and the success it's had of film festivals and its portrayal of life in North Philly. And the film has so many great parts, you know, it's like hard to pick apart. But the bottom line is you have to go see the film. Um, it's out now in theaters. Uh, tell people where they can see it, how they can interact with it. Yeah, so the film is playing in Philadelphia right now at the Ritz at the Bourse, you know, 4th and Chestnut. Um, there's four screenings a day until at least, you know, Thursday um, this week. And, you know, we, we did pretty well over opening weekend, but not sure if they're going to extend the run, you know, or not. Uh, and then, you know, beyond that, you know, probably early in the year, we'll, we'll continue to, you know, try to bring the film out, you know, in Philadelphia, but it'll become available on iTunes eventually. And then um, probably about a year from now, probably, you know, October, you know, 20. Um, 18, we're going to release the film on public television through American Documentary POV. And we're going to be bringing the film out right before, uh, you know, midterm elections because we want people to consider places like North Philly and, and families like the Rainies when they're making those, you know, when they're voting and, 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 and are we considering families like that and how can we support them? And so, um, and so that'll, you know, be, be another opportunity. But yeah, we'd love to see you at the theater, you know, this week over at the Ritz. So just, uh, you can check out our website, quest document documentary.com to learn more about the film or um, you know on social media um, our tag for Facebook Twitter and Instagram is quest the doc uh, have folks in the neighborhood been able to see it did you have a screening for them or? yeah yeah actually we had a screen it was April I think it was no, like, August 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 I'm sorry not too long ago August at the uh, Advocate Church on uh, Gratz and uh, Diamond in North Philadelphia and that was a free screen and everyone came out and that, that was actually pretty packed too. Now that scared me too because that was the actual first time it actually played in North Philly. And it played for free and we invited all our friends. The turnout was like really great and not like you talking about somebody being nervous because it's, it's okay when somebody you don't know watching your film but now your neighbors and your, your your close friends that really know you your life and they get to see the film they be like okay of course you know i never knew that about you or i knew that you know so you get those kind of racing emotions you know okay who's gonna judge and who's not gonna be my friend anymore or who's you know you know maybe it might be something that they didn't like or whatever or the guys coming to the studio 
you know, and because we post on like we have on a social media website called EverQuest Recording slash Facebook, where the, you can see the guys on you know do little clips, you know, at, in the studio, little pictures of the studio that I have, and you know those guys, you know, I was hoping that they would come, and some came, some didn't. The ones that came said they wish you, you know, the other guys would have came. People saying that they missed the film, and they wish they you know could have saw it once they heard word of mouth how good it was. So you know it was kind of scary coming to Philadelphia, you know, first. You know, but, you know, I'm glad that our friends and family got a chance to see it. And for us, it was really important to bring it to North Philadelphia first, you know, and, and to bring it to the neighborhood. Um, but we're excited now to bring it to the rest of the city. And so um, and we're going to keep keep pushing it. So I want to give a shout out to your wife, yes. Marquess. I'm a big fan of hers. Mm -hmm. She seems very rational and just like she holds it down. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Rational? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, to me anyway. But, you know, when it comes to other people, she's very rational. She's a very calm person, you know, for the most of the part. Like, cause sometimes I actually, like, honey, you're not mad? You're not upset? And she'll just look at me like, no. And I'm like, well, I'm going to be mad for you. <laughs> you know, so things, you know. So, yeah, she holds it down, definitely. Yeah. And how is PJ doing now? Because, again, you know, you fall in That's love right. with PJ, too. You're rooting for her. You want her to do well, and you know it, it, the film kind of ends, you know, with her graduation. Right. So. Yes, yeah, actually, she just graduated out of Constitution High, and uh, she uh, she's pursuing college now. Uh, we're trying to like get her to decide what college she wants to get into right now. Uh, she's uh, right now, but she she also is working right now, so she has a part time job. So she's keeping herself busy, and she's pursuing her music career. And when she goes to college, she says that. Her subjects that she wants to take are business and musical engineering, you know, so they kind of go hand and foot for her, you know, learn how to make the money, then, you know, make the money, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because, <laughs> you know, uh, she's playing the drums and, oh, yeah. you know, she has some talent there. So, again, it's like you become connected. You want to know, you want to continue following and, and, and right. know what's going on. So what's next for you, John? Are you working on another project? Are, are you taking a break? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, again, I, I love the process of making films. It's just, again, I just love tagging along with beautiful people and um, just getting to sort of, you know, hang out with them. And so I actually have another film um, that I've been working on for six years. And so I mentioned before, you know, when there was the crisis with PJ, I was in South Dakota. I was working on another film um, about another family called the Fiddlers. And so I met a guy named Delwin Fiddler Jr., Actually, it's like Quest. It started off with a North Philly connection. Uh, he grew up on the reservation in South Dakota, but lived in Philadelphia for 10 years. And uh, we connected, um, and he was like, hey, John, when do we make our movie? I was like, what? What? We're gonna make a movie? Okay. And so basically, he invited me to come, you know, with him to film some interviews with his mom, um, who's getting older. And um, we had like an amazing week visiting. He had, he hadn't been home for a long time, and then that visit really changed something in him and he just felt that, that he had to, to move back home. And so he gave up city life to go back to the reservation. And so the film um, sort of just follows him across, you know, him, but also the rest of his family. So three generations of another beautiful family. And so we're sort of where we were with Quest a couple of years ago where it's like, all right, let's see if we can build a team around this thing and, and, and figure out if we can fundraise for it. But um, I'm excited for that. You know, give me a couple more years and I'll you know, maybe have number two. Mm -hmm. All right, and what about for the Rainey family? Well, we're, um, like I said, PJ's pursuing college, so she's, she'll be off soon. But the studio will still be open. We're still doing Freestyle Fridays every Friday at 8 p.m. We do it from 8 p.m. to 10 at my home, you know, in beautiful North Central Philadelphia. Uh, you're welcome to come. You know, just uh, social media, what they how they say, inbox me or whatever, or DM. I don't know. I, I never know the lingo. My daughter's still teaching contact me. Contact me. Yeah, contact still me. Still works. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, and just come through, you know. Just, just, you know, the doors are open. Well, I want to thank you both for coming to Philly Cam and the People Power Lunch Hour Show to talk about your film and to share it with all of us. Uh, it's a great film. I enjoyed it. And I thought it was a great portrayal of North Philadelphia. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the People Power Lunch Hour Show. If you'd like more information about the film, you can visit their website at quest-documentary.com. Mm -hmm. And you can find out when it's showing in Philly and in other parts of the country. If you'd like more information about the People Power Lunch Hour Show and like to see this episode and all of our episodes, you can visit our website at phillycam.org and you can follow us on social media. All right, I'm Vanessa Maria Graber. Thank you so much. 
We'll be back next week. 